This last presentation uh, will deal with kind of two aspects. Um, one, um, as summarized uh, here, so the, the, the points to cover about the, the concept of recommended dietary allowances for genome stability or genome integrity or genome health, depends how you want to view it. Um, the effectiveness of personalized nutrition in, in intervention studies. Um, I'll be focusing just on some couple of recent papers in terms of outcomes and taking this kind of knowledge direct to the consumer rather than talking uh, very broadly. Um, I don't have, okay. And, um, and some of the challenges in applying this field of nutri multi omics or whatever you want to call it, in underserved populations and something about the ethical, social and legal issues. Uh, which may, does not kind of sound very exciting thing to talk about at the very end, but it's very important, and I'll, I'll try and lighten it up on my light slide um, with a joke that I've kind of found on the internet. Um, okay, good. So let's start about di something about dietary reference values. So um, these can be interpreted in different ways. By the way, I'm showing. Um, nomenclature that is used in, in, the Euro in Europe, uh, they talk about dietary reference values, uh, which is kind of equivalent to dietary reference intake here in the, in the USA, okay? And, uh, and the population reference intake would be more or less equivalent to the recommended dietary allowance. Um, but essentially what one's talking about is what we know about dietary intake about a nutrient, for example, uh, a particular nutrient, and how it relates to health. So if we look at the distribution of intake of a nutrient and health, and in people who are healthy, we can kind of get a U-shaped distribution. And, uh, and we can then define some thresholds, such as the population reference intake, or the um, RDA, uh, which is the level of intake adequate for virtually all people. Um, which means it's an optimal intake for the population as a whole. Of course, this data is generated from individual values. So there is individual data here in the databases anyway. So um, the average requirement intake is a level of intake uh, adequate for half the people, assuming a normal distribution of requirements. So it's that point there. It's also shown as this point here um, and the RDA here. Um, and there's a lower threshold intake, a level of intake below which, on the basis of current knowledge, almost all individuals would have an inadequate intake. And there's also another uh, indicator here, another uh, cutoff, which is the tolerable upper intake level, which is the maximum level of chronic intake of that nutrient, uh, which is unlikely to have adverse health effects. So this is uh, here, if you look at now at the risk of adverse supply level, then you can use the same data and plot it in this manner. So now this kind of data is the diet dietary reference values. Sorry. Um, I'm not pressing the wrong things today. Um, here we go. The dietary reference values are important for supporting public health, uh, developing labeling laws, and identifying populations at risk of over under undernutrition. However, the process of developing them is complex, and they should not be viewed as recommendations or goals for individuals. Okay, that requires more um, a, a, a more detailed approach and specific approach. Rather, they require interpretation by professionals and can form the basis of dietary advice. So, <clears throat> some years ago, I started, uh, given the accumulating evidence in our lab as well as in, in the labs from other groups and also founded by the seminal work of Bruce Ames in this field, uh, I started developing the, this concept. Maybe we can think of dietary reference values of individual micronutrients, but also nutrient combinations, <coughs> which I call nutriomes, for genome damage prevention. And the reasons for this are, are quite straightforward, in my view. 
we know that damage to the genome is the most fundamental pathology. Right? From day one, we start as one cell. All of us started as one cell. And that DNA in that cell had to be replicated over and over again. Right? To be what we are today. And even as adults, our cells turn over. So the cells in your mouth that you have today were not there 21 days ago. They are copies of what you had before. So literally, we are photocopies of photocopies of ourselves. Now, if you think of a photocopying machine, and you try to copy a page over and over again, you, can, you know that the copy gets worse and worse, and more so if the toner isn't working well, right? And you could think of micronutrients as the toner in your DNA copying machine, um, which make it give you a good copy or not. Right? So unfortunately, literally, we are poorer copies of what we were some days or some months or some years ago. And the aim here is to try and improve this, this ability of cells to make good copies of DNA. So higher DNA damage, uh, the, the other important point is that higher DNA damage levels predict increased risk uh, from infertility, pregnancy complications, immune deficiency, developmental defects, and degenerative disease. There's a, a mountain of knowledge and literature uh, supporting this. Furthermore, we know from basic biology and from what we observe in vitro and in vivo that the regenerative potential of tissues depends on capacity of cells to make good copies of nuclear and mitochondrial DNA repeatedly. Um, and we know that there are cell cycle checkpoints that will stall the vision if damage cannot be resolved. The ultimate goal is uh, to match the nutrient to the genome of individuals or genetic subgroups or in certain countries and populations where, where the nutritional and dietary pattern is restricted by food availability. Um, therefore, to match the nutrient to the genome, to optimize genome integrity and prevent pathological levels of DNA damage at the population, genetic subgroup and individual level. We always think of aging as something that happens after <coughs> midlife, right? But in fact, we actually age, start aging from the very first division. As soon as there is a genetic uh, uh, defect accumulated and damage accumulated, you are already aging. And we know of, of accelerated aging syndromes, such as progeria, where an individual who's only 10 to 15 years old looks like a... 60, 70, 80 year old. So aging happens all the time. Now, um, a recent review here by Lopez Open et al., and there's an, um, a one that's been updated more recently, has so identified nine hallmarks of aging. And of these, four of these are genomic hallmarks of aging, which are the most uh, uh, fundamental of the nine, which include genomic instability. Um, which relates really to chromosomal instability mainly, um, telomere attrition, epigenetic al alterations at methylation and histone level, and mitochondrial dysfunction, which also includes mitochondrial DNA deletions. Furthermore, these lesions, this kind of genomic DNA damage, also affects cellular senescence and stem cell exhaustion. So in many ways, directly or indirectly, DNA damage has a strong effect on the hallmarks of aging. And of course, if you could, you could also study loss of proteostasis, dysregulated nutrient sensing, and altered intercellular communication, which may directly or indirectly be impacted by this. Ideally, you also measure these other factors. Now, how do you diagnose DNA damage? What's the way to do it? So in the early days, it was quite simple. And we did meta just metaphase analysis and lymphocytes. And it's a very powerful technique. Still is used to study chromosome damage, let's say, in radiation exposure biodosimetry, if there was a radiation accident or a nuclear attack. Um, and this has been become uh, molecular cytogenetic. You can use probes to look for rearrangements. And it's very sophisticated, but it's laborious and somewhat expensive. Uh, more than 100 years ago, it was discovered that you can measure chromosome damage with uh, measuring micronuclei, here shown as how jolly bodies and red blood cells, which are increased by folate and B12 deficiency. These days, we mainly do it in lymphocytes. There's an advantage because you can study lymphocytes in vitro and in vivo. 
if we can model in vitro to predict what might happen in vivo. And furthermore, these days we live in an era where cells are grown outside the body and put back into the body, right? Immune cells, stem cells, and so on. So it's important to know how to grow stem cells and these kinds of cells in vitro as well. So we need nutrient requirement values to prevent DNA damage also in culture anyway. Um, we, of course, uh, know about telomeres and excessive telomere shortening being associated with aging. Mitochondrial DNA deletions increase with age due to great uh, large deletions in the mitochondrial genome, probably caused by replication stress. Um, we can measure base damages such as oxoguanine, oxidation of DNA that can affect gene expression also. Uh, we can measure DNA methylation at the DNA level and look at strand breaks by comet assay or by gamma H2AX measurements. So there are multiple ways. However, we are ultimately limited by which of these are best validated. So how do you go about doing a validation process of DNA damage markers in that you might want to use in nutritional studies. So in this review I wrote in 2010 in a, an American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, I put a table which is shown here and I've just updated it with more recent information. Okay, this is, I'm just uh, showing ticks and boxes. So this is, looks, very, it looks quite crude. This just cr tries to summarize where we're at uh, more or less. So the way I suggested that we could do it is first of all, look at whether, whether there are studies indicating that this biomarker, these biomarkers of damage, either individually or, or groups of them, are associated with nutritional status cross-sectionally, which is low-level evidence, and in placebo-controlled trial, which is higher-level ev evidence. And in that, I would also include um, depletion-repletion kind of studies as well. Um, and then, are these biomarkers associated with developmental or degenerative disease in cross-sectional studies, which is low-level evidence, and in prospective cohort studies, which is higher-level evidence? And uh, I would consider that those assays where you have ticks and boxes and all of these would be at a level where they might be, in fact, considered as being um, adequately validated or better validated depending on the number of studies. These studies are accumulating and increasing quite rapidly since uh, 2010 when I did the review. At that time, only the, you could say that the micronucleus assay and lymphocytes had ticks in all of the boxes. Telomeres, with telomeres, there weren't any intervention studies, but now there are, okay? And with DNA methylation, there weren't any prospective studies at the time, but now there are, okay? So the, the field is kind of shifting, as you would expect. And it also indicates the interest in this field uh, to do this kind of work. Now, I'll just give some very few examples about uh, aspects of justifying uh, dietary reference values. Um, I'll, I'll simply give one example here on chromosome damage, which is the protein calorie malnutrition data. First reported in the 19, early 1970s and in the uh, in what was it, in nature, actually, okay, showing that protein calorie malnutrition in children increases chromosome damage uh, by about 5.5-fold. It was followed by another study about three years later in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in a different cohort, showing a 6.5-fold difference in children that are protein calorie malnourished. And a study more recently in 2009 in Argentina showing a 6.6-fold uh, difference in increase in chromosome damage. Now, these are large increases in chromosome damage. If that was a radiation accident, we would really be, if that was happening in, uh, caused by radiation, we would be really worried because that would be a, a significant dose of radiation. And, we'd, and, and we legislate against that uh, kind of exposure. In fact, this is even higher than what you would expect from the two rad exposure per annum that is considered the upper limit for exposure for the general population. What about examples of the association, association of a biomarker of, of DNA damage with increased risk of developmental degenerative kinds of diseases? So I'm just showing you data here for the micronucleus index and lymphocytes, which I also showed yesterday, but not all on one slide here, showing the association with uh, co pregnancy complications, 
of this marker have measured prospectively here in the mother at 18 weeks gestation. The increased level of micronuclei predicts a higher risk for preeclampsia and intrauterine growth restriction. In a big study uh, to the human project, which we put together in 1997, with data from about 33 laboratories, about 7,000 individuals, uh, retrospectively and prospectively following the um, association with cancer risk um, 15 year, 12 to 15 years later, those with a medium and high level um, had a higher uh, risk uh, of cancer and the same with cardiovascular disease mortality. With dementia, we have association studies, we don't have prospective studies so far, but um, these of course have to be done to get the, the high level evidence. But there is also other evidence that supports um, this uh, effect because there is also association of DNA damage markers such as this with cognitive function. I proposed a roadmap to determine dietary reference value intakes for genome stability or genome health or genome integrity, uh, whichever way you want to, sit, to look at it. First, we should look at nutritional variables, and these could be either single micronutrients, they could be combinations of micronutri micronutrients, functional foods, food groups, or a dietary pattern. The kinds of study designs can be done in a systems way, looking at in vitro models to begin with. We can do that with human lymphocytes um, very well now. Um, it takes you usually require about um, at least seven days of culture. We usually go to 14 days to start seeing the impacts of different nutritional levels. You can do in vivo cross-sectional studies and, of course, placebo-controlled interventions, which then become the higher level of evidence. The kinds of outcome measures, well, the primary ones would be the DNA damage markers. Ideally, use a comprehensive set. Uh, such as using micronucleus cytomassays, you could use comet, DNA oxidation, telomere, DNA methylation. Probably I would go mainly with the micronucleus assays, DNA methylation, telomere, and mitochondrial. DNA deletions would probably be the optimal subset to be looking at this in a very comprehensive way. And of course, as a secondary outcome measure, you should al always measure the micronutrient in the tissue uh, where you are measuring the effect. Um, with regards to dietary reference values for genome integrity, well, we would need databases on the vitamin and mineral requirements for genome that are associated required for genome stability in diverse genetic backgrounds at the various life stages uh, that are that are associated with optimal genome maintenance. Now, I'll just go a bit more deeper with an example I am very familiar with, and I feel a bit more confident, and therefore I can go faster and meet the time target. Uh, and that is the folate and B12, uh, the, the impact of folate and B12 deficiency uh, on, on DNA damage. And these are the pathways and, uh, by which this happens. So in the case of folate deficiency, it's a matter of uh, one aspect is DNA methylation, which, relates, which causes centromere defects and causes chromosome mass segregation, aneuploidy. Um, leading to aneuploidy. Uh, in the case of elevation of homocysteine, this can increase oxidative stress and cause base damage and DNA strand breaks, which leads to um, uh, chromosomal instability. It could lead to telomere attrition and abnormal gene expression. Uh, and one other aspect of folate deficiency is an increase in the uracil uh, to thymidine ratio because you need to methylate DOMP to make DTTP. So uh, thymidine is, a for, is a, in fact a measure of methylation as well. If uracil uh, is too high, it accumulates in DNA, it causes DNA strand breaks and causes chromosomal damage um, and telomere dysfunction and, and induction of P53. Um, in the case of B12, B12 also causes a folate deficiency indirectly because if methionine synthase is not working, then folate is trapped. It cannot go into the cycle uh, in, in the one carbon metabolism cycle. So it's not available, basically. It's not available. Fo what you have is the methylfolate tries to get into the cell. It, the cell cannot keep hang on to it because it cannot convert to tetrahydrofolate and it just goes in and out of the cell and does nothing. And therefore you get the same effects of folate deficiency. But in addition, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency leads to the accumulation of methyl malonic acid because B12 is needed for methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, 
This leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. There is also some evidence that metamalonic acid itself can have some, as some induction of DNA damage. Now, let's start looking on the personalized aspect. There's always interest about the genetic side, and therefore let's talk a bit about that and go in a bit more deeper. One of the gene, in fact, the gene that is most studied in, in, in nutrigenetics, in epidemiological studies and intervention studies and so on, is the C677T polymorphism of methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, which converts 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate. Now, this is the form that you need to convert DUMP to DTTP. Uh, and what MTHFR, requ which requires riboflavonase cofactor, converts 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate to 5 meta tetrahydrofolate, the form you need to convert homocysteine to methionine. Now, there's B12, which will block it from happening. But let's just focus on this. So if you are deficient in MTHFR, what will happen is two things. 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate will accumulate and will in fact be more available to convert DUMP to DTMP. So it could be a good thing in this sense. However, you will not be able to generate 5 meta tetrahydrofolate, which means that you cannot convert homocysteine to methionine. So homocysteine increases if MTHFR is not functioning, either uh, uh, because you have a mutation, let's say. Now, if you can't generate methionine, then you can't generate acid and acid methionine, and you cannot maintain methylation of DNA. So you generate hypomethylation in cytosine in DNA, which then alters gene expression and alters the structural methylation sites, such as the pericentromeric region of the chromosome, which leads to chromosome aneuploidy and fragmentation. Um, so, yeah. Now, can, you can now study the impact of, so you can do the study, so using a nutriome nutrient array, which is, a, which is a way you can interrogate cells for their nutritional requirements for genome stability. You can then do, design a study, which was very ably done by Michio Kimura, who was a Japanese postdoc in my lab, and did all of this in six months, which was incredible. I've never seen, it, it baffled me completely. It was done so meticulously, so, exactly and so efficiently it was incredible and all with a smile it was amazing um wh what we what sh the design was to have seven uh, individuals who have got the the normal variant so this is the normal genotype so the cc homozygote and the and the while and the uh, the variant that has got lower activity of mthfr the 677tt homozygote and we grew them under low folate, low folate, li low riboflavin condition, low folate, high riboflavin, high folate, high riboflavin, and high folate, low riboflavin. So this way you can look at nutrient-nutrient interaction and nutrient-genotype interaction. Okay? And nutrient-nutrient interaction is actually very important also to consider in personalized nutrition. And and we grew these cells for, um, I think it was um, ten, nine day, eight to nine days, which is the minimum. You need at least seven days to start to see these effects. So uh, what was evident was, as we would expect, the DNA damage markers, micronuclei, nuclear plasmic bridges, and nuclear buds, these are the markers of genomic instability. This is the fingerprint of genomic instability that you will see in cancers, okay? Um, you can see that uh, these markers all increased under folate deficiency, okay? But you will also see, if you look carefully, that under low folate conditions, high riboflavin actually increased damage to a small extent. It was significant for nuclear buds, almost significant for uh, nuclear plasmic bridges, and there was a trend upwards for micronuclei, okay? So that was unexpected. So more is not better. And it depends on the context. So in this case, the context is low folate. Although there was also a hint here, even at high folate, but wasn't. What about the genotype? If we look at the TT homozygote, which is the is the is the very is the variant that ha with low activity, we actually um, saw, and in, in this case, we saw an increase in micronuclei. But we saw a reduction in nuclear buds. So it depends on the biomarker. So what, why would that happen? 
Well, micronuclei can be induced either by breakage, causing a chromosome fragment, or by chromosome loss. Now, if the effect is on DNA methylation, then it would be a chromosome loss effect that would be independent of breakage and the formation of gene amplification that leads to nuclear buds. So it suggests that the increase is probably due to chromosome loss, not to breakage. Um, we see what we expected in that homocysteine would increase, but in intriguingly, cell proliferation was increased. Okay, And this we don't really quite understand why that's happening. So there must be some other ways that, in other words, what we're seeing here is an increase of proliferation under conditions where there's some evidence of increased genomic instability. And why that's happening is intriguing, because that's what happens in cancer. In cancer, you get increased proliferation in a genomically unstable cell. I'll be moving, suggests that maybe these conditions could be moving you in that direction. However, this, uh, this information, is the, these kinds of models are important because it puts into context. You can then use um, analysis of variance to determine the percentage of variance explained by the cofactor, riboflavin, by the substrate, folate, right, of MTHFR, and by the genotype. And, and this is the data summarized here. What you can see in the case of micronuclei, most, the largest variance is shown by folate, not by genotype, not by riboflavin. The same with nuclear buds and the same with nucleoplasmic bridges. However, with homocysteine, the impact of the genotype was as strong as folate and with uh, the cell number, the number of cells dividing as well. Riboflavin did not have a strong role here, okay? Although it had some role, it wasn't as big as folate or the genotype. And it depends on the biomarkers. So it's when you start looking at the specific biomarkers, you can see that the effects are different. Okay, so you, if you look deeper, you can see that this is more sophisticated uh, than maybe we would like it to be. And therefore the interpretation of the data has to be done carefully. What happens in vivo? So in vitro, we couldn't see an impact of, MT, of MTHFR that was strong on the DNA damage markers. Now we're focused on the micronucleus index. And in vivo, we also see the same. We looked at the uh, MTF, MTHFR polymorphism here. Um, and we looked at the polymorphism in the reduced folate carrier, which brings the 5-meter five five folate into the cell. And we looked at a polymorphism in methionine synthase, methionine synthase reductase, and GCP2, which is, which is needed to convert polyglutamated folate to monoglutamated and to get into the cell. The two that remained significant in our population, okay, uh, were uh, methionine synthase, the A2756G polymorphism, and the reduced folate carrier. So these two steps getting 5,10-methyl-tetrahydrofolate into the cell, polymorphism in that gene, and then converting 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. And having the G allele of these two polymorphisms was associated with the lowest level of DNA damage. So genotype does matter in vivo. It will probably vary between countries. We probably so see no effect of uh, MTHFR because riboflavin intake is high in, in Australians. So that negates the effect of the polymorphism because that can correct it, um, and so on. So all of these things together indicate that. Interestingly, the G allele uh, in methionine synthase is also occurs with higher frequency in those who live to be centenarians, at least in a study that was done in Germany some years ago. Now, let's look at dietary intake. So this is an association study of dietary intake by food frequency questionnaire and the micronucleus index. We can see here that higher intake of vitamin E, calcium folate, retinol, and nicotinic acid is associated with lower frequencies. With beta-carotene, it's a U-shaped curve. Mid-level intake is associated with reduction, high intake with more damage. Whilst riboflavin, pantothenate, and biotin are associated with more micronuclei, at least as reported in a food frequency questionnaire. Now we can also look at the combinations. 
So in vitro, we saw we observed that higher uh, riboflavin intake in a low folate background is associated with more DNA damage, and we also observed this in vivo uh, when we combined the data together. You can also see here in, uh, the effect of of uh, interaction between folate and calcium intake. When you have high folate intake associated with high dietary calcium intake, the DNA damage level appears to be reduced by up to 60%. Okay, so the combinations appear to matter. We have not done interventions, of course, to verify this. So this is low-level evidence, but it suggests some trends and some consistency with vitro data. We can also look at the relationships with uh, plasma levels of um, B12 or folate or, let's say, homocysteine. Now, we generally find that B12 matters more than folate in vivo in our cohorts in terms of the DNA damage levels. And we tend to observe that vitamin B12 um, requirement probably should, ex should be probably above 300 picomole per liter to minimize DNA damage. You will always find some outliers, uh, uh, whether you like it or not. The data is never as tidy as you'd like it to be. But it is quite consistent, even when you look at risk for um, cardiovascular disease and for dementia, that levels of B12, probably around approaching 300 and above, are usually optimal for preventing these kinds of pathologies. Homocysteine lower than 8 uh, micromole per liter, we find to be associated with less DNA damage. What about intervention? So we did this study in young Australian adults who are not folate and B12 deficient by criteria, clinical criteria for, of requirements for prevention of anemia. In the placebo arm, there was no change in the DNA damage markers. So I'm just showing you here the results in the treatment arm. And they were treated by two doses of a combination of B12 and folate. The first dose was 7 microgram B12 and 700 microgram folic acid which was, a, at that time, um, based on the recommendations at the time, that was about three and a half times the recommended intake, and then we took it to um, 10 times. What we observed was that those, so we then stratified the data, depend, those who were in the bottom half of DNA damage level at baseline, and those who were in the top half of DNA damage level at baseline. What we observed was that there was no impact at all of this intervention on those with below average levels of DNA damage. So supplementation was of no benefit to people with, of low level of DNA damage. The benefit only occurred in those with higher levels. But we also, there was a trend, a subtle trend, that maybe the DNA damage levels start to climb upwards if you go to higher doses. Okay, so having some some uh, dose response effect um, is important to understand. Okay, I mean, these are relatively small changes, okay? Um, but it's important to look at this, to have a, a, a dose response. Uh, now, there's a whole lot of data here that uh, we reviewed, that, um, that I reviewed some, some uh, about five years ago, and this, this review is due for uh, revision. Um, and basically what I did was I listed in these tables the, uh, for each genomic instability biomarker that was studied, be it strand breaks, micronuclei, uracil in DNA, telomere shortening, methylation, mitochondrial DNA deletion. The concentration in vitro, if it was an in vitro study in culture associated with reduced DNA damage, the concentration in plasma that was associated with minimization of DNA damage, the concentration in red blood cells associated with reduced DNA damage, and the daily supplementation dose, all right? And I very crudely tried to summarize this data into how would, I, how would you translate that data into a recommended dietary allowance, bearing in mind that this is really limited data, okay? All right? But just as an example. So if you uh, estimated the mean of minimum concentration required to optimize genome integrity as a, as a kind of cutoff, right? You could say, and you only use the in vivo data, you could say, well, maybe a plasma concentration of folate greater than 37 nanomolar might be needed. A plasma concentration of homocysteine, which is a metabolic marker of folate status, less than 
an RBC folate concentration, I didn't move that sign over here, greater than 930, maybe that would correspond more or less, based on the data, the intake level of about 500 microgram per day. I excluded studies where they were taking above the upper limit, uh, that is currently recommended, and the proposed upper limit anyway would be around 2000, which is the current. If we looked at B12, based on the data available, the plasma concentration of B12 should be more than 233. Uh, fortunately, we do not have data on active B12, holotrasco balamin, which would be uh, informative. Uh, the plasma concentration, again, would be less than 7.5. Unfortunately, we don't have methylmalonic acid data. And based on the results available, maybe a proposed intake level of about greater than 7 microgram per day, and maybe an upper limit of 20 microgram per day. Okay? This is based, this is a, just an example. It's, it would not be publishable, uh, probably. And, uh, uh, but it just gives you an idea, a taste of what we could do. Okay? That, that's all. Of course, it's also limited in the sense that we don't have, ideally you take this to nutrigenetic subgroups. There's just not enough data to do that. This concept then, with this knowledge, uh, once it becomes mature, it should be possible to think, if, if DNA damage is the most fundamental, uh, then we have to think in terms of, uh, can we reduce it? Can we diagnose it? Can we think of a clinic, a genome health clinic, where we do all of this, make some personalized recommendation to reduce the DNA damage level rate to its possible minimum, and with the intention of minimizing the risk of developmental and degenerative diseases. Now, let's go to personalized nutrition, which I'll try to do in five minutes, maybe seven, if I'm lucky. Um, the effect, well, the effectiveness of personalized nutrition intervention studies depends on what we mean. Which functionality or health outcome, in which cultural context, depending on which personal dietary preferences, based, is it based only on habitual dietary intake relative to recommendations, based also on genotype or phenotype or both, is the evidence good enough to be actionable? That's the most important point. Now, there have been some studies. This is a study done by Ahmed al Sohaimi, who now heads the uh, um, Nutrigenomics, which is a direct-to-consumer service or to health professional service. They, they provided information on genotype in relation to caffeine, vitamin C, um, sugars, uh, intake of sugar and sodium. The genotypes are listed here. Uh, and they gave some recommendations um, uh, to participants, uh, 92 participants. And basically there was a, uh, a control group that got no information. Um, there was an intervention. Um, there were those who were intervened with a personalized advice uh, who did not have a risk allele, and there were those with who were intervened with this information and did not and had the risk allele. The outcome after 12 months was that only for one of these w uh, was there some change in the habit. In other words, those with the ACE risk allele in the intervention group reduced their salt intake significantly relative to the controls who only receive generic guidelines. And this is their self-reported intake, okay? So it's really soft data. A bigger study uh, completed by food for me a EU study re uh, reported very recently, um, a much bigger study on about 1,600 people uh, who were d d uh, divided into four groups. One was a non-personalized information. This was all done via the internet, by the way. Um, and basically it was around providing uh, advice regarding healthy eating habits, okay, and lifestyle. Now there were four groups. The level zero, it was non-personalized. It was gen generic information provided to the public um, based on European population guidelines. The level one group received um, personalized dietary advice based on their individual dietary intake that they reported. So if they were going away from the guidelines, they were given some advice. This is what you should do. You should eat more folate, maybe less meat, and so on. Um, level two re received personalized dietary advice based on individual dietary intake and phenotypic data. So if they were obese, 
they were asked to reduce their energy intake and so on. And level three re received personalized dietary advice based on their intake, phenotypic data, and genotypic data. And the genotypes that were information was provided was MTHFR relating to folate, the FADS1 relating to omega-3, um, TCF7, L2 relating to diabetes, FTO4, obesity, and APOE relating to dementia. What really happened was this, <coughs> that ultimately it demonstrated that personalized uh, information provided um, the, a, sig a better response to the information, okay? So they complied more to reducing salt intake, to uh, reducing saturated fat, increasing folate intake. This is all self-reported data, by the way. Reducing energy intake, red meat, reducing red meat intake, and improving their healthy eating index. So by and large, personalization does help. <coughs> However, and that personalized interventions can be delivered successfully to in individuals across several countries using the internet, because this was across Europe. <coughs> However, there was no evidence that including phenotypic data or phenotypic plus genotypic information enhance the effectiveness of personalized nutrition advice. Furthermore, plasma cholesterol, carotenoids, and omega-3 index did not change despite the self-reported dietary improvements. These were measured on using a blood spot that was collected, self-collected and, and sent back to the labs to measure. So, <coughs> In a way, the efficacy wa of reported change was good, but th at the blood level, it did not result into uh, an outcome. A sub-study of this was looking at people who had the APOE genotype, so they were genotyped for APOE4 or not, and they investigated the interactions uh, of genotype with habitual dietary fat intake. The advice was to reduce cholesterol, okay, if you have the APOE genotype. Um, so there's greater need to maintain healthy cholesterol concentrations. That was the advice given to all of them. The ones with the genotype told that they need to work harder at it because they have this risk. Bottom line was that um, the personalized nutrition targeted to APOE genotype was more effective in reducing saturated fat, but it, it didn't matter whether they had the risk genotype or not. Um, disclosure of APOE genotype in fact, that they were non-risk may have weakened the response. And there was some evidence for that. Now, potential reasons are that uh, unless you uh, actually make people uh, in interact personally with them and really emphasize the risk with cholesterol and cardiovascular disease risk, you're not going to get behavioral changes. And the EU study, they didn't do that because the ethics committee didn't allow them to scare the participants. <laughs> okay? However, there are studies on disclosure of APOE genotype. So basically, disclosure of APOE genotype to adult offspring in the study in The Lancet um, um, did not cause significant short-term psychological risks. And those who were non-APOE carriers, non-E4 carriers, were relieved, so they were kind of less anxious. But those with high emotional distress before undergoing genetic testing actually did suffer some distress. Okay, so there is some concern there. So some prior screening is needed. In a Finnish study, uh, what they showed was the levels of state anxiety and threat experiences were increased in APOE4 carriers. Information apo of on APOE genotype impacted experience of cardiovascular threat. In other words, they were felt threatened by it. And the fear of threat and anxiety, they said, may not be an obstacle for using gene information. So it depends how you look at it. To motivate healthy, stable adults towards making diet lifestyle choices. Okay, so there are varying opinions. Now, what about if we go to applying this kind of knowledge in underserved populations? I really could not find much information. I'm now sub-zero. Um, so I could only think what I think, and this is what I think might happen. It's likely there's going to be insufficient in education in these populations to be able to understand and appreciate this information. So you'd probably confuse and distress people, maybe unnecessarily. I'm, it depends. I don't know how it would work out. It would be interesting to test hypotheses along, along that. It would probably be too costly to make healthy food choices. 
and to a certain degree prohibitive in terms of the diagnostics and maybe there will not be enough professionals who can interpret and deliver the service effectively in these communities, depending on what the local governments do. Uh, a study in Europe suggested that there is a potential market for personalized nutrition in the EU, but the majority of people are not willing to pay for personalized nutrition advice. Okay? The willingness to pay, they would not pay more for genetic advice than they would for other kinds of advice, nutritionally, essentially. And, and, and really, large-scale adoption of personalized nutrition is likely to, be to require inclusion in national health services, as there are, for, for example, tests for inborn errors of metabolism like phenylketonuria, where, of course, personalized nutrition uh, works very well in the public health context. And there's 80 of those for which tests are provided, at least in California. Ethical and social and legal issues, the main ones are disclosure of genetic information to third parties, such as insurers or employers, granting, granting access to genetic material and information contained in databases, and disclosure of genetic information to relatives or a proband, a relative. And this is in the US, all underpinned by GINA, which is the law passed in 1995 and signed, uh, proposed in 1995 and signed in 2008. So anybody who wants to do this kind of activity should read that um, document carefully. So take home messages. It is feasible to determine dietary reference values or DRIs based on prevention of DNA damage. I think in principle it is feasible. Uh, appropriate nutrition intervention in those with elevated DNA damage or subclinical deficiency in nutrients required for genome maintenance can improve genome integrity. There's quite a lot of data. There is a growing knowledge about nutrigenetic factors affecting dietary requirements and health outcomes. Nutrition recommendations based on genotype should only be actionable if the nutrigenetic evidence level is high and the health benefits substantially exceeds that provided by genetic pu generic public health advice. It really has to be different and, and stronger than just generic public advice, and it's got to be obvious that it will make a difference, such as in phenylketonuria. Right, where you where you provide a particular diet low in phenylalanine. Disclosure of genetic information may cause distress. There are circumstances when such disclosure may be unlawful. We need to be aware of that. In a practical sense, in the real world, I think identifying what works at a personal level is also important. Hence this joke here, which basically the doctor is saying to his patient who is in his bunny suit, if hopping burns more calories than walking and it helps you eat more salad, then okay, I approve the bunny suit diet. Right? So it also means is you have to be very sensitive to the context of the individual, the culture, where you are, to implement these kinds of things. And with that, say goodbye. This is the team in the lab. Quite a few have left, either because they're students finishing. Unfortunately, we've had some couple of redundancies as well due to cuts in funding in this field. But we're still a nine-person team strong and we'll be around for a few years to go. Thank you.